Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. I hope you are uh, prepared for some more excitement. I hope you had a good couple of days um, because we're going to get started on ancient engineering. Uh, we did the we did the requisite um, words, uh, Google Sites bit. Uh, so now we're actually going to get into the meat and potatoes of the first set of lessons that we have for you guys. In this case, uh, ancient engineering is a good start. Um, it's mainly, mainly just for some of like the basic concepts and stuff like that before we get into actual the actual development of ancient siege weapons and things like that. And all of this is just sort of additional knowledge on top of um, what you guys will be doing for lab. I mean, it's not necessarily going to be directly related, but it's cool to know exactly why these things work how they do uh, so that when you build your ballista, you can get a decent idea of... <laughs> uh, no, all good. Uh, sound broken. It, um... Am I coming through clearly? Like, raise your hand if I am. Never mind, it looks like it, uh... All right, good to know. Um, it might have just been a connection issue. Uh, but it looks like it disconnected anyway, so we'll see how that goes. Anyway, um... <clears throat> Melanie Martinez distracted me. Okay. <laughs> um, like I said, this is all just sort of additional knowledge. And, uh... Yeah, no, rip and peace. Rip and pepperoni. Um... None of it's strictly necessary, but it's kind of interesting to know anyway. So that's part of the reason why I'm going through it, too, just so uh, we have <coughs> all of this additional knowledge to work with. Plus, you can see, you know, how clever humans were back in the day. Never forgetty. We'll skip that. So as far as ancient engineering and stuff like that is concerned... Um, we're going to start off with a bang. We're going to talk about the anti-Cathera mechanism. Mom spaghetti. Um, and this was actually discovered about 100 years ago. Well, rediscovered, I should say. It was invented back in ancient times. Developed back in ancient times. But it was rediscovered uh, over 100 years ago uh, in a shipwreck found or found off the island of anti-Cathera. Hence, anti-Cathera mechanism. The ship sank during the times of the ancient Greeks, and there was this, as it was described, blob of rock found among the debris. And using X-ray technologies, we discovered that it was a mechanical device. Oh, what happened here in the question box? It's just okay then. Um, I noticed that came out when I was only a little bit older than you guys. Um, anyway, the, the uh, well, I'm spaghetti. Um, using x-ray technologies, we discovered that it was, in fact, a mechanical device, in this case, the anti antikythera mechanism, or antikythera, something like that. It was a calendar, a celestial guide, and it listed the Olympiad event schedule, and it's all made up of simple machines. And if you wanted to, mm, here, let me go ahead and pull it up on Wikipedia. This is what it looks like. Hold on, let me move my thing out of the way. Now, um, obviously, it didn't really uh, survive being underwater for a very long time as most things don't. It's forgivable. Salt water is very harsh on metals. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this is sort of what was going on behind the scenes, a whole bunch of different sized gears and everything like that. And this is an idea of what it looked like in its, <clears throat> in its prime, which is pretty cool. Uh, it was meant to show the movements of planets, so in that sense it was a calendar, uh, the phases of the moon, uh, the time of day, the like 
mentioned here, the various Olympiad events, uh, or at least the Olympiad schedule. And uh, it was, for that reason, it was actually, you know, a marvel of ancient engineering. Also not, you know, crazy huge either. Well, it was a decent size. <laughs> There's a schematic representing the gearing of it, which um, basically the point being there were a lot of gears in this thing. There was a lot of work done in order to make everything move at its own independent pace that timed correctly with the celestial movements. As you can see here, you get the sun pointer, the moon pointer, Mercury, Venus, the current date, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Uh, and you could use these in order to keep track of, you know, again, the phases of the moon as well as, as the position of the sun and all the planets in the sky. Uh, whoops. That's because that was paused. I thought I'd unpaused it. Anyway, uh, here's the gearing mechanism for it. Crazy complex. Um, let me go back. Here's a picture of the actual mechanism itself. Uh, like I said, salt water is not very kind to metals, so it obviously didn't fare very well being underwater for, you know, a couple thousand years, or at least a few hundred years. Many hundreds of years. A couple thousand years. Uh, here's a sort of a top-down view of all of that gearing. If we go back to the schematic, this is a top-down view of it. So there's, yeah. And then this is what, this is a computer-generated image of what it might have looked like in its prime. So as you can see, you've got the moon here, you've got the sun pointer, you've got, you know, Mars and uh, I believe Jupiter and, and just a couple of other, you know, things here. You've got a time. It also points to, you know, the various Olympiad events and things like that. So it's actually a pretty neat uh, piece of machinery because it can do a lot of different things. Oh, okay. Well, they were still, if you'll remember, they were still basically um, working with a heliocentric model, or excuse me, a geocentric model. Uh, but regardless, the um, this is this is meant to show the movements of the uh, of of the other planets from our perspective. So from that sense, they managed to sort of, they, they managed to imitate the movement of the planets, the celestial movement, uh, even though their, um, their perception of why these things were moving was not correct. And that there's, it's also, it's also important to note that they were, they were, you know, their scholars and stuff like that at the time were sort of wondering if the geocentric model was correct. Um, you know, it, when a lot of, when a lot of people say that, like, you know, we, we didn't move away from a geocentric model for forever, um, that's really only partially true. Um, presumably it was quite accurate. It was enough to, uh, you know, to be regarded as a marvel of ancient engineering. And people were able to figure out what exactly it was meant to, you know, <clears throat> without any explanation as to what was on it. When they rebuilt it, they were able to, um, you know, figure out what each thing was meant to do based off of the movements of these individual dials. Anyway, um... There was there were theories that we were a, a heliocentric model um, before you know uh, Galileo and all that kind of stuff. It's just he helped to sort of bring that idea to the masses, so that when people were ready to accept the fact that it was a heliocentric model, when we had you know other uh, astronomers concur with him and and bring forward theories that helped reconcile that with what we saw in the sky. Um, you know, we, we could sort of shift as a collection of Europeans at that time towards a uh, heliocentric model. But yeah, it was made up entirely of simple machines, just a bunch of gears and stuff. Doing, doing the things that gears are good at doing. Which is spinning at different rates. 
Now, in order to better understand the simple machines that sort of that pretty much made up um, the technologies that comprised ancient Greece, uh, it's important to understand the forces that they were uh, sort of basing all of these these ideas around of, and that was just some very simple forces. We've got push or pull force, which are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, pushing force is pushing, you know, pulling force is pulling. And then there was also the mathematical idea of work, which is force, in this case, an exertion, times distance, times the cosine of theta, which is, is simply um, just the, the it's a it's a direction uh, on a on a two dimensional plane or if it gets more you know complex sometimes a three dimensional plane but anyway when force and displacement are in the same direction then work equals force times distance so you can drop this last bit out of it and just make it force times distance so if you're pushing something or pulling something in a direction then uh, work can just be force times distance, but if you're pushing something and as a result the object is moving in an, a different direction, like if you're using a pulley or something like that, or if you're, um, you know, pushing something that's on an arm that has a very specific uh, direction of movement. Yeah, seven. Seven is generally the answer anyway. Seven works. Uh, we exerted seven works worth of force, or excuse me, uh, works worth of energy in order to get this thing to move. But yeah, no, it's, it's in a simplified sense, it's work equal, equals force times distance. Newtons, yeah. So don't confuse effort with work. Pulling on a locked door is going to be lots of effort, but there's going to be no work because the door did not move. So you expended energy. You, you used force. But because the door did not move, there was no work actually being done. And I, that makes sense. You know, I mean, you didn't actually get any work done. You just spent the entire time pulling on a locked door. So a simple machine is a device that makes performing work easier by accomplishing one or more functions, either transferring a force from one place to another, changing the direction of the force, increasing the magnitude of the force, or increasing the distance or the speed of the force. One day this coughing fit will go away. We've got six classes of simple machines. You've got an inclined plane, You've got a wedge, you've got a screw, you've got a lever, you've got a wheel and axle, which is not pictured here, but uh, similar to the pulley, which is the sixth class of simple machine. So the inclined plane is a way to uh, reduce the amount of force necessary just by uh, changing the direction that the force is in. Having to lift something straight up requires a lot more effort than lifting something up on an inclined plane. Oh, okay. So ideal mechanical advantage versus actual. So now we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do this. Ideal mechanical advantage versus actual mechanical advantage. Ideal mechanical advantage is, there's got to be a simpler way. Let's, let's skip this. So basically, um, ideal mechanical advantage is what you're hoping for mathematically, and actual mechanical advantage is how much, uh, the basically the ratio of, of forces, the amount of effort that you expend versus the amount of effort that's output. And the reason why the two don't necessarily line up is because there can be things like friction. Um, you know, if you've ever slid along the ground, you've experienced friction in a very acute way. Um, if you've ever rubbed your hand on the carpet, you've experienced friction. 
flexing. Uh, you know, if you're pushing something up an inclined plane and it bends in the middle, ideally you'd be working with something like that. But if you, you know, put a box and you're pushing a box up and as a result, the, that inclined plane is bent, hopefully not that much, um, but you know, it gets, it gets pushed downwards. And that means that this area right here is at suddenly a much steeper incline than it was at before, which requires you to expend more force. So that's another way that, you know, that, that kind of difference can be uh, created. Mm. So the ideal mechanical advantage in this case would be the length divided by the height. In which case is it it's the basically the the incline of the plane um the shorter the incline or the 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 gentler the incline the uh the better the mechanical advantage you have the steeper the incline the lower the mechanical advantage you have thus the more energy you have to expand in order to lift it up the same height um Then you've got the wedge. In which case, the um, the ideal mechanical advantage is how far in you can push the wedge, basically how long the wedge is versus uh, how wide the wedge is. Because um, if you have, let's say you have a very short but wide wedge, well, you're going to have to expend a lot of force in order to separate two things with that wedge. like say for instance two planks of wood because you're going to have to get that wedge in there and separate the, those planks very very quickly with this short amount of distance on the other hand if you have a very long wedge and you insert it into those planks of wood you have a much gentler you can think of it like an incline. You have a much gentler incline, and so even though you know you're you're expending force this way, maybe um, you're expending more work because it's moving further. You're using less force, and in the end, you could be using less work because the amount of force that you're using is so much less. But yeah, so you can use a you can use a wedge in order to separate two things, or or you know lift something up very slowly, or whatever. And the longer the wedge is, the more you have to work with because the gentler this uh, this diagonal is, thus requiring less effort on your part in order to get it in there. And you've got the screw, which is good for well a number of things: lifting things up, uh, getting getting a screw into something, holding things there holding things together. <clears throat> but uh, oftentimes it, it adds additional sort of force in lifting things up because it transfers that lifting force to a rotational force. So in the case of this car jack, you're, not, you're lifting the car up, but it's much less effort for you because you're actually just spinning the screw that causes the jack to extend. In which case, you know, you don't have to expend nearly as much effort in order to get that car lifted up because it's much easier to, to, to rotate a screw than it is to actually lift the car up. The ideal mechanical advantage in this case is the length of the spiral on the screw because it's um, the smaller those are, uh, the, uh, let's see here, 2 pi length of the action divided by P. So the smaller these are, um, you may cover less distance with each spin, but it's requiring less effort on your part to, you know, spin the, uh, the screw each time. Versus, you know, if there were like five, I don't know, five, uh, five spirals here, so there was a great distance between each spiral you would cover more distance each time you made a full rotation, but it would also require more effort on your part. Then you got the lever, which allows you to basically use uh, a, um, a fulcrum point in order to lift up something heavier. 
than you normally would be able to. You got the first class lever where the uh, the fulcrum point is closer to the output than it is to the input, so something like a pair of pliers, in which case you'd get a great amount of um, basically a, a great amount of um, force on the output versus the input. But you have a, a, a more limited uh, movement on the output side. Then you've got the second class. Well, this is also so you can you can um, multiply the force um, from input to output. You got the second class where the output, the the counterweight, or excuse me, the um, fulcrum point. Whew, that took me a minute. Is on the ends, and the output is between the input and the fulcrum points. Uh, which allows you uh, just to sort of reduce the weight of something, uh, in the case like a wheelbarrow here. And you got the third class where um, the fulcrum point is at the end and the input lies between the output and the fulcrum point. And that can be something for like something like tweezers, which allows you to, it reduces the amount of um, basically input to output multiplication of force. But on the other hand, it does allow, like you can think of tweezers, it allows a pretty good amount of, it still allows a pretty good amount of force, but it also allows a great amount of dexterity. So, let's see here. Yeah, okay. What class of lever would each of these items be? So, for instance, how about the nail clippers? Think about where the fulcrum point is and where the input and the output are. So you're thinking it's one where the fulcrum point exists between the input and the output? Okay. Somebody else thinks it's a third where the input lies in between the output and the fulcrum point. Yeah, it's listed here as second class, but I would I would be more inclined to think that it's a third class um, because uh, let me think here because this is your output at the ends and then you got your input in between your output and your fulcrum point which would put it like a like a third class. I didn't make this presentation though, so I don't know what their reasoning behind making it second class was. Anyway, how about a crowbar? All right, we got to vote for first. Well, yeah, it's first class. Imagine you now placing a a crowbar against like a like a door or something like that. It would rotate around this point. So that would essentially be the fulcrum. Interesting. Or you can think of the, the fulcrum being whatever the, the crowbar is leaning against and then pulling the crowbar the very edge of the crowbar uh, would be the actual output and then it would be leaning against something which would provide the fulcrum. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I encourage you guys to, to try and, and, and reason to that on your own, though. I realize that, yeah, it's sitting down here. And then, yeah, the fishing rod. Third class because... Yeah, I guess so. So your hands would be right about here. The fulcrum would be here. Maybe it would be leaning against you or you'd just be using your second hand as a fulcrum. Uh, like if you have one hand over the other. Yeah, it does. It also has a pulley on it. That's very true. If you have one hand over the other. Or it could be a screw. Hmm. Could it be? With a series of pulleys. Um, so imagine how you hold a fishing rod with both hands, right? That bottom hand would be a fulcrum and the top hand would be the input. And the output would be the very end, how it just sort of whips 
out into you know forward and then the the line extends and it goes out into the water and all that business mm. and we got a wheel and axle <clears throat> And a wheel and axle, basically, uh, yeah, essentially, is a wheel and axle. Um, a gear is essentially a wheel and axle. Um, the way a wheel and axle make your life easier is the, the greater size of the wheel compared to the axle allows you to transfer more force to the axle. Basically, you're taking advantage of the fact that you have a longer fulcrum or lever which allows you to increase the amount of power that you're exerting upon the axle. If the wheel was the size of the axle, it would require a lot more force in order to turn it. But as it stands right now, because the wheel is so much larger, you expend much less force in order to spin this axle, which allows you to tr multiply the force that you're um, exerting upon the, uh, the axle. As you can see, the ideal mechanical advantage is the radius of the wheel divided by the radius of the axle. The larger the wheel is, the larger your ideal mechanical advantage would be. The larger the axle is, the smaller your ideal mechanical advantage would be. So again, if you have a, an axle that's larger than the wheel, you would actually be exerting much more force to spin it um, than you would be if you were just trying to turn the axle by itself. That would be something very silly. On the other hand, um, a wheel will spin, f well, it will, it will cover more distance with each rotation than an axle will. So that's why you have wheels on a car. Because um, <clears throat> each rotation of that wheel allows the car to cover more distance versus whether or not it was just sitting on axles. On top of that, obviously, it keeps the bottom of the car off the ground, which reduces the amount of friction. But there's also, there's also something to be said for the fact that the wheels will well, even though they're making the same number of, of revolutions per second, they are spinning faster than the axle because the axle is covering less distance. Yeah, you put the force on the axle, so it's a little bit backwards in that case, but um, there are... There are there are a lot of other things that go into um, turning a car axle, spinning it around, um, causing it to spin, causing the car to move forward, which means that the, the force in and of itself is, there is some loss, but not as much as there would be if you were just spinning an axle. Like the, a lot of times they're, they're transferring force into a different rotational force and um, there might be a larger wheel on the axle itself. Uh, it, it, it's a, there, there's more that goes into it than just uh spinning the axle by itself. Then you got a pulley. And a pulley works by basically distributing the force among uh, you know multiple multiple pulleys or multiple lines of rope. So you know a gun tackle <coughs> you're li you're lifting up essentially uh, just one of the pulleys by um, by creating a using a downward force instead of a, a lifting force uh, also the fact that it's running along a couple of different wheels means that the weight or excuse me the force gets distributed as you have yes uh, it, generally it is true that the each pulley cuts the force needed in half <clears throat> zero three two plus plus six nine one seventy four divided by eight yeah exactly I agree <laughs> All good. It's fine. I've done that before. I, I I have a number of friends that I that I talk to online using an online uh, VoIP server, and I can't tell you how many times I've been trying. Like they must know all of my passwords because I can't tell you how many times I've tried to like put my password into a program. I'm like it's not taking it, and then I and then I realize that the VoIP program has focus, and I've just sent my password three or four times to them. It's not something I'm proud of, but this is the age we live in. <sighs> anyway, with a pulley, the ideal mechanical advantage, it's also not something I recommend doing. I just, I just trust them a lot. I'm just you know, saying that it's not unusual for that kind of thing to happen. 
um, the mechanical advantage is split evenly among each, basically the length that it runs. So a double tackle will, yeah, the mechanical advantage of a block and tackle equals the number of sections of rope that support the moving block. So the gun tackle here supports at the least. Uh, a watch tackle will, you know, will uh, have a higher mechanical advantage, double tackle higher, uh, gin tackle higher, and a threefold purchase will be in this example, the highest amount of mechanical advantage because it has the most sections of rope running between the pulleys. Now, granted, there was a whole bunch of other stuff. This this kind of stuff is pretty cool, like Damascus steel, Roman cement, Greek fire, hero steam engine, the Baghdad battery, the Roman cup, the Viking compass, natural gas lines in ancient China. I'll actually spend a little bit of time talking about each of these. Uh, and corrosive metal coat in ancient India. So yeah, like the Damascus steel was a very, very strong um, way of manufacturing steel. Um, it was able to cut through lesser swords and it kept an edge very well and it was flexible as well as strong. Um, it's important to note that we it's not outside of our manufacturing capabilities in order to make something like that, but we're still, the the process has been lost in time, and so we're still kind of like, we're pretty sure this is how it's made, but we're not 100% sure, but based on the style of metal um, that we can make now compared to ancient Damascus steel uh, examples, we can say with reasonable confidence that we know how to make it today, but just not as we're not, you know, we don't, we don't know for sure. And I, it's kind of interesting. It's not necessarily like, you know, ancient aliens or anything like that. It's just a process that's been lost in time. Then there's Roman cement or Roman concrete. It lasts over 2000 years. We know the ingredients that the Romans used. And if we try to, to make it, it doesn't necessarily turn out well, but it's one of those many technologies that was lost in the Dark Ages. Um, that whole period of time where basically there was uh, essentially f fear and superstition ran rampant. And um, there was there was poor documentation about, you know, previous technologies and things like that. And there was there was a lot of loss of uh, knowledge from from the you know previous ages and things like that it's interesting to think that we could be in a different place technologically speaking if the dark ages had never happened that's obviously not something that i can really say with certainty and i know that there are people out there that would say otherwise and they have very very strong evidence pieces of evidence to back that up but it is an interesting thought There's, there's sort of evidence on both sides of that argument. But anyway, uh, Greek fire. Ancient Greeks made napalm, essentially. Um, a flammable material that has sort of a gelatinous quality to it, and we reinvented it in the 1940s. But yeah, that little picture that dude is holding, essentially, an ancient flamethrower. Um, Hero steam engine. Um, as you can see, you light a fire underneath, and steam comes out. There's basically water inside of this ball, and steam comes out of these tubes. And because they're curved, it causes the thing to spin. And so by using water and fire, you have a very rudimentary and very effective steam engine. Based on um, modifying this, you know, it's it's plausible that there could be some there could be some modern use out of it. But for now, it it's a it's a pretty interesting little. Uh, engineering marvel. Blows out the fire. So you can hear on the uh, 
the microphone. And over time, it'll just eventually slow down and stop because of friction. Um, Hero, or he might have also been known as Heron, alternatively. He was a writer, an engineer, and a scientist, and he may have invented the first robot powered by falling weights, which is kind of interesting. And there's the Baghdad battery, which is uh, an actual battery. Uh, it, was a, it was an urn that was also a battery. Um, it produced a very weak current, um, but it was possible that it was used in like religious ceremonies or in the process of plating gold on things, because a lot of times gold plating uh, involves running an electrical current through the gold um, and the the item that you're plating it to to create a uh, a uh, an electrical imbalance. Um, one one of the materials will be negatively charged and one of the materials will be positively charged, and you, essentially you're using um, uh, electrical force in order to keep the two things together which is intertwined with magnetic force. Then there's the Roman cup. You add light to the cup, and the glass changes color. In essence, it's, it's a form of nanotechnology. Um, it's more just, you know, nanoscience, but still, it's pretty cool. Grand gold and silver flakes to nano-sized particles, and then the way that they reflect the light means that the light looks, or excuse me, the color of the cup looks different in the light. Then you got the Viking compass, which was as accurate as a modern compass, used to navigate low light and fog situations. Um, and it used crystals to amplify existing light. And then there were natural gas lines in ancient China, like the same kind of natural gas that's used today to you know, power gas stoves and gas heaters and things like that. Uh, they actually had lines running to you know, different um, places like, that needed natural gas. And they're the, the South American airplanes. But these are artists attempting birds come up with something that kind of looks like an airplane. And then there was the spark plug in the 500-year-old rock, which the spark plug was actually made in the 1920s, but the soil sample was mistakenly dated. And ancient astronauts, of course, the proof can be explained using, without using space people. The... As fun as it is to think about, you know, ancient aliens and things like that, there's really not much evidence out there supporting it. It's it's more just good old humans being pretty awesome. Because that's the other thing about ancient aliens and stuff like that, saying like, oh, aliens came and gave us the ability to, you know, uh, make electricity or build the pyramids, and it's or they built the pyramids for us. Like, it kind of discounts what humans are able to do in their ingenuity. Like, it, it kind of... I almost think it's kind of more amazing and mind-blowing to think that humans were able to do this stuff just because they were like, we're going to do it, and we're going to figure it out. Yeah, we don't need aliens for that, A hey, LMAO. Um, so, you know, I think that's pretty cool in and of itself. Uh, the idea of aliens coming and visiting us is kind of an interesting thought experiment, but it's there's not really anything supporting it. But yeah, that's um, that's actually what. Which one are we missing? I feel like there's there's one missing. Oh, the corrosive metal coat. I I'm actually not sure about that one. Um, that does it for this presentation. So let me go ahead and uh, let me pull up the presentation on well another uh, ancient engineering presentation, and we can get started on it uh, before we move on uh, for the night to other things. For instance, my other class, because we got some time. Huh. Okay. So we did that one. Uh, let's, let's, let's go over Archimedes' war machines, because 
Yeah, man. That's pretty awesome. We'll spend some time going over this, and then we'll do architecture as well. No, actually, let's start with architecture first, because the Archimedes War Machines one uh, requires some additional information before we can continue with that. I know architecture is not nearly as exciting as, you know, war machines, but you don't want to uh, do all of the fun stuff at once. So anyway, we'll talk a little bit about ancient engineering architecture today, and then we'll continue with it on next Monday. <clears throat> huh. Oh, I don't know if I can take you up on that bet. But what is an archi <laughs> architect? Uh, the profession of architect is not a modern concept. Derived from the Greek word architekton, which is pretty cool. So uh, archa is chief and tekton is carpenter. Uh, in many ways, this just pretty nicely sums up the profession. It's the chief carpenter. I mean, you know, the architect of the building is architect of the building is the person who is mostly pretty much in charge of the building's design and how it's constructed and everything like that. The most basic definition of an architect is a professional who is qualified to design and provide advice, both aesthetic and technical, on built objects. But this definition barely scratches the surface of an architect's role. Architects serve as trusted advisors, blending diverse requirements and disciplines in a creative process while serving the public interest in addressing health and safety matters. It's a pretty, um, pretty lofty definition of an architect there, which, you know, it's, it's a big job. Obviously, I wasn't trying to be condescending or anything like that. But architecture is a profession that mixes art, building aesthetics, and science, engineering, structural design, and, you know, things like that um, together. So the edifice or building or structure is a reflection of the surrounding culture. That is to say, you know, think about architecture and the different types of architecture and things like that and how buildings can look similar. You know, a lot of like modern buildings that are built have this sort of specific look about them. Uh, there's like that, that kind of like fake stone thing going on, or, you know, they have a very specific set of colors to them and uh, the, the way they're lit, you know, there's a lot of like um, indirect lighting and solid colors and stuff like that. You know, they'll, architecture is isn't it as much a uh, a structural engineering sort of uh, job it also very much takes into account um, designs and styles for the time think about going to like an old strip mall or something like that and what everything looks like there <clears throat> and then think about you know going to a more more modern one and how everything looks differently um, Think about like buildings in the old west versus um, you know buildings in in Germany or buildings in Spain or buildings in in Great Britain. You know they're all very similar to one another, but they all have their own sort of look to them as well. Um, and it, depending upon you know whether or not it's like a Germanic or more of a Romance language based thing, and you know history and stuff like that, uh, they'll all look different from one another as well. Like the, the, the construction of the Capitol building looking like ancient Greek and Roman uh, architecture is, you know, it's no coincidence it was during a time when there was the, sort of the, it was a very rationalist sort of idea and it was, it was trying to revive these classic designs because a lot of people were thinking about how ancient Greek and Romans were very logically minded and enlightened uh, civilizations and we wanted to emulate that so you know it's it's no accident that that stuff looks similar but anyway yes the main tenets of architecture can be better un understood by looking at evolution throughout history so here's a very very brief history of architecture starting on Monday Yeah, we'll go ahead and start this on Monday because I want to go through this whole thing in one go. And on top of that, um, I ended a little bit late 
on Monday and I ended up being late to my high school class. So I want to make sure that I'm there on time. <laughs> so why don't I go ahead and uh, we'll do the poll questions and then we'll do question and answer time uh, like we always do. You guys know that drill at this point. And uh, you know how many questions after I ask the poll questions, you're more than welcome to head out. Have a wonderful weekend. And uh, we will see you on Monday. Uh, no, I take that back.